Dang. Awesome. Well, okay, challengers, it's day two. So excited to um, get into the the food conversation. Uh, it's it's uh, probably the mo one of the most important things that you're going to do in your health and fitness journey. And uh, it's something that you do every day, hopefully, um, which is eat, eat wonderful, nourishing food. So um, let's, let's tackle this critical uh, topic. And in the email I sent about it today, I um, kind of referenced the religiosity that used to be about food. And I was, I was scoping out the the conversation on TikTok in the last few weeks to see what people talk about in the health and fitness space. And I was really impressed with the dialogue around food um, from various TikTokers. And I know that's not the whole market fitness industry, and but it is certainly um, uh, one part of the pulse. And I was really happy to see that people are, you know, excited about food, advocating food, um, as a good thing in terms of eating enough and, uh, you know, eating frequently. And obviously there's all kinds of opinions about what to eat and how much and we're going to get into that today, but it's the kind of the sun is setting on, um, calories are this bad thing that we should avoid. And food is this dangerous thing. Um, and you can, re it's really easy to do it wrong. So there's a lot of like fear around food. The sun is sort of setting on that conversation in the fitness industry and the sun's rising on this newer conversation about um, food is love. Like food is literally uh, energy that the sun has given the earth and the plants have turned into uh, cacals and then animals have eaten those plants and we eat the animals. So we get this direct love from the sun or indirect love from the sun and um, food is is a, a very powerful form of love. And it's also, it deeply impacts our epigenetics. Um, I was having a conversation with my uncle who went through a, 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 a form of leukemia over uh, the last few years. And his treatment was vitamin A and folic acid, I think. And the concentrated vitamin A and folic acid actually changed his DNA and fixed this uh, uh, maladapted chromosome that was creating this, uh, the leukemia. And I just, first of all, it's just fascinating. And I love my uncle and I'm glad he's still alive and that's really wonderful. Um, but it also, it also just reminds us of the power of nutrition and, and nourishment to affect our DNA on a day-to-day -day basis. And, um, we have some input over that. And, um, and the third, third thing I've noticed in the conversation is uh, people talking about how time is an important variable around eating. And by time, I mean that how long you stay in a particular diet. Lots of people are talking about how quickly or not quickly certain bodies adapt to certain ways of eating. And how long should you be on a cut or in a diet? Or how long should you reverse diet or not monitor or have a diet break? We're going to cover all that today. And I'm excited because it's a lot much more fun uh, conversation than I'm used to having. So um, number one, I, I shared with everybody the example meal plan of uh, a, a plate reflecting your goals. And there's sort of two versions of this. There's the performance meal plan and there's the fat loss meal plan. And the, the primary difference between um, eating for performance and eating for fat loss is well, I guess there's a few differences, but the one of the main differences is when you're eating for fat loss, you have to be in a somewhat of a calorie deficit for a period of time. So your fat loss plate, you're going to pull from the same food groups, but you're going to be a little bit more sparse on your selection of fats and carbohydrates. And you're going to be pretty earnest about the, the protein because the protein is going to be a critical factor in keeping the muscle that's helping your metabolism stay active. Um, uh, your metabolism, your base me metabolic rate is, is heavily reliant on how much muscle you have in your body uh, to determine how much calories, calories you're going to burn at rest and through the various activities that you do. So the, you have a fat loss meal plan and you have a performance meal plan and the fat loss meal plan is going to draw from the same foods um, minus the fat and the 
carbohydrates or uh, with a little bit less of an emphasis on fat and carbohydrates. And the performance meal plan is going to include those. And the perform the inclusion of um, fat and carbohydrates is for two reasons. Number one, building muscle takes energy. So if you order, this might be important to write down for a future reference. There's an order in which your body will prescribe calories. Your brain is the number one consumer of calories. So your, your body's going to prefer that your brain is fed first. So the more problem solving, the more stressful situations you're in, the more alert you need to be, the, the higher your cortisol, essentially the more uh, fight or flight or problem solving or action oriented you are during the day then the, the higher uh, priority your brain is going to be and the more uh, stress-related energy consumption you're going to uh, focus on with your body. Meaning that uh, your brain and your uh, survival activities are going to take the majority of your calories and tissue repair comes third on the list. So it's brain, work-related activities, tissue repair is the third is the third sort of tria or third tier in the category of uh, energy consumption that you that you use during the day, and you have to be resting in order to do com or complete tissue repair. Meaning it happens when you're sleeping or when you're in a relaxed state. So it's third on the list. It's also frequently the the least amount. The people spend the least amount of time in a in a resting state or at least intentionally resting. So if you're trying to improve your performance, you have to have a little bit of extra energy and you also have to spend a little bit of extra time and focused attention on resting and recovering. And fat and carbohydrates help with that process. Uh, help, help build muscle and uh, create the performance adaptations. There's a lot of the, the adaptations that we're trying to get in the gym, whether it's to lift more weights or run faster or have more endurance, means that we're going to have to be more inefficient with the energy that we that we have in our bodies, meaning we have to burn more. So if we don't have those resources available, our body will be reluctant to adapt that way. So that's the biggest difference between the performance and the and the fat loss meal plan and eating in alignment with your goals is something that you're going to probably bounce back and forth uh, uh, between those two goals uh, throughout your life. You're not always going to be in a calorie surplus. You're not always going to be in a calorie deficit. But importantly, we're trying to figure out what to do when and match your eating to your intention to your goal and what you're actually doing in your life. <laughs> okay. Um, so covered uh, a little bit about what to what strategy to use when. So on your examples, you've got uh, your performance plate, you've got your fat loss plate, and then you have room to fill in some imaginary menus. Now this is pretty much, well, this is a, an important exercise because um, if I'm going through this with a student of mine and they're unable to come up with um, op options that are in alignment with their meal plan goals, then they're going to get stuck. And oftentimes we're going to revert back to default behaviors or default choices. So to prevent that, now is a great time to brainstorm. Now, show of hands, who has completed the exercise and actually have all their meals filled out? <laughs> oh. I did plan out my whole day today already. It's already loaded in my fitness pal. Now I just have to execute it. Heck yeah. Okay. That's, that's, that's a, that's a, that's a jump start. And so <laughs> we got the applause. Good. So uh, you've done a, an important thing too. You've also, you've automated it and audited it so you can have trust and verification that you're on the right plan. So um, is that common for you? Do you do that a day in advance, Tanya, or is that something you're trying to work into? It's something I've, I have been thinking about over the last few days leading up to the new year. And then um, I implemented it and started logging on the 30th, 31st, maybe like just getting back to putting in my stuff. And I was doing it retroactively. 
And then today I thought, you know, I want to see that I'm on path by the end of the day to meet my protein goal. So what do I need to do to get there? And then I just started like popping in amounts of protein and calcium until I found, basically I'm having a chicken apple sausage and four cups of kale for dinner, but it, that'll get me there. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, hey, hey keep it simple. Um, yeah. and, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, okay. I got a question from Kayla. Um, can you elaborate how we can burn more calories at rest? Yes. Yeah, so I'll save that for the end. That's, I mean, it's fun. Um, but absolutely. Uh, so, but when I want to finish with the meal plans, so, um, Tanya's a step ahead, but we might as well get into it. The, the purpose of this part of the challenge is I want you to have complete trust in, that your, that what you are, that your meal plan is in alignment with your goals and that you can actually eat the meal plan. Because the biggest thing that I notice when people get started on their fitness journey is when they map out what they're supposed to eat, it, one, it feels like either not enough food or too much. It doesn't, it's not what they're normally doing. So there's, there's conflict, there's resistance. Like, I don't know if this is going to work. And what I like about um, uh, the Kronos app or my fitness pal, um, whatever version you have, um, there's many other, uh, you know, apps for counting calories and macros is most of the science is pretty on the back end is pretty consistent among those apps and the formulas they're using. So what it does is it validates that what you're eating is actually going to support someone of your body weight with your goals. So if you have a goal of, you know, putting on muscle, uh, chronometer and my fitness pal, they're going to be within a hundred or 200 calories of each other at the end of the day. So you're going to have a, a great consistency. And that, even if it's not a, exactly a, a match, it's a reminder that, Hey, these, these numbers come from somewhere and they're, they're supported by science. And it, it may take me personally a little while to adapt to eating that way but that's the change process and that's why you you set goals in the first place so uh tanya's done that and do you have an exact match with your macros tanya i don't know what you mean by that what are you like, saying um Ask way. you said you wanted to get into a calorie deficit and then you put in your protein minimum and the things that you needed to eat did you get uh a reconciliation between the calories you wanted to eat and what you have to eat? Yeah. Like, so, like so far, and I, I'm not perfect on this yet. I'm still kind of evaluating what the day is going to look like, but from a nutrients perspective, it looks like I'm going to end up at 105 grams of protein, which is important to me to get between 80 and hundred because I've worked with you before. So I, yeah, <laughs> that's what we're doing. Um, but the other thing I'm kind of focusing on is calcium because of my cancer medication and, um, fiber cause has, and I noticed like, oh, I'm still behind. Like I'm doing pretty good on calcium, but I haven't figured out how to get the fiber in. And all of it so far, I'm 161 calories left in a 1200 calorie day. So I'm just trying to, I have to refine it a little bit and I'll play around with it. Honestly, I was going to say like, I don't know if you use this Kayla, but like the, my fitness pal or whatever, figuring out like just popping in some foods that I eat to say like, how is this going to stack up to help me get my, like my Josh plan? Is it working or not working against it? And I was like experimenting honestly for like half an hour this morning to go, what does I need? Oh, that's not enough kale. Like one cup raw is not enough to get me what I need for those things. So it's just a little bit of that, but ultimately I'm going to be like, hopefully right in sort of within a range to be on par to those goals. Is that what you're asking, Josh? Like, yeah, that's, yeah, that's basically it. I mean, the, um, the key is, um, when we, when I set a goal, I, um, I use the, the true North as like, um, I use a range of calories. So I'm going to give you a little chart, um, uh, a, or a little, a sort of spectrum of, you know, left to right, uh, for whether you're in a calorie deficit or calorie surplus, but the biggest calorie deficit you would ever want to be in is seven or eight times your body weight in calories. And then a huge surplus for someone who's like, we're doing two a days or whatever would be uh, 22 times your body weight in calories. So those have, you have much different goals, right? On either end of the spectrum. 
but uh, what you want to what you want to do is you want to pick something that's easy to hit first, and then make your adjustments walking back. So um, if twelve hundred might be you know pretty close to what you need, um, it's been a while since I had your numbers memorized, but uh, the uh, you just make sure that you're not starting with the most ambitious part of it at the end, and so that you're making it difficult to adhere to at the mm -hmm. beginning. Because what it sounds like, and I'll give you a, like a, a fitness analogy here in a second, but it might sound like it's going to be more effective and more dramatic to do that. But actually, it's really hard to hold yourself to that standard uh, for the course of a few weeks if it's difficult to hit you know, any particular day. And it's easier to just walk it back once you have an easy to hit number than it is to try and climb up. And um, an analogy I see or I, I use a lot is, like when it comes to like trying to help somebody improve their squat max, if I'm trying to get somebody to add a hundred pounds to their squat, I don't start them out with doubling their squat, right? I start them out with just five or 10% more than they're used to. And then slowly over time, adding it up as it feels good and easy to hit the next step. Because mm -hmm. most people are uh, don't like pain and aren't able to hold their breath long enough to enjoy that process. So that's uh, that's just a little fitness analogy on selecting that number that you're shooting for and, and making it work for you. Um, okay, um, so we covered determining what to eat. We've covered verifying through a, through a, through an app and using tools to support you and reinforce what you're uh, what you're looking for. Then um, a couple pieces in my uh, metabolic restoration course. I teach my students how to do biofeedback, which is checking in, not just on appetite, but on all the other ways that your body is talking to you to tell you whether or not it's time to add or subtract food. And this is important if you're somebody like me, who is pretty high energy and like focused, I might not feel hungry. So my appetite might not be the best uh, tool to use to calibrate when my next meal should come. In fact, it's if I'm eating in a structured way, sometimes I'm not ready for the next meal, even though it's meal time, and I have to pick something that's really easy for me to eat and use. <laughs> good, good. All right, Tanya, good that you're on the right track then. So, um, so having multiple points of feed reference points of or points of feedback for your your, your diet process or your nutrition process. So how's your energy? How's your appetite? How's your sleep? What's, uh, what, wh how is everything lining up in your life? Like when I, uh, I did a fast a few weeks ago, not actually it was a few months ago now and God, it was the worst experience ever. And I just realized I have too much going on to, to not eat for 48 hours. I, uh, I used to love it. Now I don't love it as much. Um, kind of threw me into a rage. Maybe it was the coffee. It doesn't matter. The point is, is that you have to listen to your body and, and play with or take what the defense is giving you. So always, always make sure that you're giving yourself an opportunity to succeed. Now I want to talk about um, when to shift strategies. So good, good ranges for diet and diet breaks. So the shorter, okay. So some heuristics, some like uh, industry, industry, uh, uh, reference points. The shorter the cut, the shorter the the shorter the intervention, the more effective the variable. Or no, the shorter the time frame, the more effective the intervention. So I'm I'm going to see better results for a student at three weeks of cutting, and a one week break and another three weeks of cutting than I will just doing twelve weeks of the same cut for the same athlete because the body adapts, whether it feels like it or not, the body adapts very quickly to what we're doing. Um, so if you're on a long, if you're on a long-term plan and you're trying to create um, a dramatic change. So if you're trying to add 20 pounds of muscle, well, I wouldn't suggest force feeding yourself for a year straight. I know that there are athletes that do that, but what I would do is I would break up the year into, you know, six or eight week cycles of adding calories and giving someone a break, letting them recover and then add some more. And the same thing when someone is dropping weight or trying to cut weight. So give them, you know, three to four weeks of a, a, a strict diet, take a break. How long should that break be? 
at least seven days, 14 is fine. Any more than that, and it's just a new phase, it's a new cycle. So I would just take a, about a week off in between your in between your uh, phases of going through a cut or um, or going through a reverse diet where you're trying to build muscle and, and speed up your metabolism. So time is a big variable. If you find yourself gritting your teeth, you're probably going too long. If you're finding yourself hating the diet or all you can think about is food or you want to stab your partner, just you, you're, you're, you, probably give, you probably need a break for a short, a short period of time. Okay, good. All right. Um, good question. I don't understand the reverse diet. Yeah. Well, um, I never did get that. Like when I went from 1200 calories, you know, to add back more, I never really understood how to do that. So can we talk about that a little bit? Absolutely. Absolutely. Great. Um, we'll do that. And we'll also, this feeds into Kayla's question, how we can burn more calories at rest. And I'll link up um, to the Facebook group and to this email, uh, this follow-up email about a uh, podcast where I think the mind pump guys are talking about um, dieting and they, you know, spend hours talking about one thing. So it's really great to just hear it over and over again, but reverse diet is simply, so if diet is reducing calories, reverse diet is increasing calories. So the other thing that those apps are really good for is I think my fitness pal does it. I know it does. Um, to different nutrients, but chronometer and some of these other modern apps, they have a suite of micronutrients uh, ranges for every person. And you can see, um, uh, you can see what they recommend in terms of vitamin E, vitamin D, vitamin C, B folate or B12 and folate. You can see all of these different um, um, nutrient levels. And when you reverse diet, um, the way that I approach it is I start to fill in all the missing nutrients that a person has while they're on the, on the cut or on the diet pro process. And then we basically started to restore all the missing things, all the things that we had to leave out while we were doing the cut. So the reverse diet is really a restoration phase and sort of a, um, a, a watering and, and uh, a, a soil treatment so that you can get stronger plants more abundant crop. Uh, but it, what it does is it helps improve your performance in the gym. It helps you sleep better, helps you heal from injuries faster. Everything just, I, I'm just in a better mood when I've got all of my minimums met and I feel really good. So the reverse diet, the goal of it is to actually bring yourself past the calorie point at which you started so that you begin to get your body to tolerate eating more calories with the same activity level, which plays into Cal, uh, Kayla's question because what we're trying to do um and you know the, the the way that i approach the human body is i want to optimize every person's energy vitality and performance at whatever it is that they do and it's very difficult to have a high performance machine that has no fuel so we want to condition our bodies to be able to tolerate and produce as much energy as possible and in America, where calories are abundant, it also behooves us metabolically to be able to tolerate uh, eating more without adding fat. So that means having a, a very, um, a very robust, what used to be called metabolic drive, which is the amount of energy that you burn at rest, but is also the resting metabolic rate. And you do that by having a complete nutrition profile, being fairly lean, so having lots of muscle, uh, a high strength to weight ratio, um, um, having as much muscle as your frame would tolerate and hold well. Um, and also generally by being a happy person, that actually is a big, um, a big factor in uh, your metabolic rate, which I know Tanya has been working at for the last uh, year and a half. Working hard. <laughs> uh, or longer, that's right. So um, reverse diet nutrients and um, burning more calories at rest has to do with um, what you're eating, how you're eating, um, what you're doing with yourself outside of, of, your, of the gym and outside of work. So um, your level of mindfulness, how much stillness you have in your life, how much fun 
and uh, how much muscle is ultimately the measure of it because your body won't put on muscle if you are back to the beginning of the conversation, which is a perfect literary wrap to the this this video. Uh, your body won't adapt and put on muscle if it doesn't think you have the energy to sustain it. So um, that's why that it's so not complicated. It's muscle is and and physical ability is the end stage adaptation that you get in any uh, athletic program um, because it's. Um, yeah, it's a function of not just the work, but also the rest. And scene. <laughs> um, I just still feel like, I don't know, Kayla, you were asking about how do you burn more at rest? And in my head, I've always been thinking like, if you have more of your body is muscle, then that's more efficient and it burns more per minute or whatever than like non-muscle, right? So that's sort of how I think about that. Josh, is that like, that's true. And, then, and so that if that's true, that's how, how we burn more at rest. Um, but then the tactics for that are where you like optimize, optimizing your calorie content and number feels like the, the tactical execution for that objective of burning more at rest. Is that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Getting there. Okay. And so then like, that sweet spot is tricky. Like if I'm trying to lose seven pounds or six pounds, five, six and a half pounds, six pounds, something like that. So I'm going to go 1200 calories because I know that does that for me, or that's where we started last time. So it's like, four, I'm going to have three, 400 calorie meals a day, basically, you know, whatever. And, um, but then, and I'm also like working out, you know, I did my little weight regimen this morning in my house just new and so I did that and I'm going to go for a walk and do a meeting on a treadmill in a minute and all these things so then my deficit will be building because I do the 1200 and then let's just say I live 1200 calories worth in a day so I'm at zero but then I exercise so then I'm like 200 below that or I should have 1400 or something are you saying like that's where to make sure I have the energy I need to do those things that we want to do to build the muscle. I have to make sure I eat those extra 200. If I burned those 200 on a walk or working out during the day, like, cause well, that's what is... scares me. I don't want to go over 1200 net or whatever, you know? Well, you're, you, you nailed it. So, um, so much good stuff here, Tanya. Um, uh, we'll talk about this on video five or um, on day five in terms of the five pillars of uh, metabolic function. But the, um, in essence, you, it's very difficult to be the Spider-Man who uh, jumps from one building and lands on the flagpole of the next building, which is kind of like what you're trying to do when you're trying to eat exactly 12 and burn exactly 12 or 14 to create the deficit. And and the reason for that is, I'm, I'm sure you've like looked at the literature that the amount of calories, if you put your dinner plate in a barometric chamber and set it on fire, it would be 400 calories day, on day one, day two, it would be 250, day three, it would be 450, right? So every potato mm -hmm. has a different amount of calories right. and every Tanya burns a different amount of calories, depending on what she's doing in the barometric chamber. So I could have you doing nothing for a day and it's 1200 and then it's 800 the following day. And then it's 1600 the following day. So those numbers are all averages, right? And so we, um, I'm not saying the math doesn't matter, but it's not necessarily a zero sum game every day. It's a, um, the body's a system of systems and it borrows from one if it needs it that day. And it returns that energy uh, at the end of the day. And there's a, a fascinating article I'll send. I'm just gonna, there's, there's gonna be 15 articles on this email uh, going out, but um, there's a really great explanation of high intensity interval training and how it borrows a bunch of energy from the cardio. It doesn't use the cardiovascular system on that day, but it borrows energy from it to, com to complete the training. And then it returns it and, and through the you know execution of aerobic uh, energy exchange, it brings back the energy that it borrowed. So it's, it's super cool. It's very fascinating. But um, to answer your question directly, uh, uh, be kind to yourself. Even if you hit all of your numbers perfectly, that's where your adjustments and your biofeedback take uh, come into play and you play the game over time so that 
if you if your 1200 doesn't perfectly work, you can adjust up or down in a couple of weeks so that you end up getting where you want to go through a course of, you know, we'll call it trial and error, but it's really just course correction and learning. Got it. Boom. So good. These are the these are great questions. Thank you guys for making this or gals for making this a wonderful uh educational video. Um if you have anything else, I'll, I'll, I will I can uh, uh, hit it before I go. But what I'm going to do is I'll save the video, send it out, put it back on the homepage, and then I'll link a bunch of articles either to that or I'll put them in the Facebook group or both. Okay. Yeah. Can All I right. ask one more question? Go for it. So just this deficit thing. So if I'm using my fitness pal and generally everything's the way, you know, kind of the the sciences behind all those things is it is the deficit i'm looking for making sure that i'm zero or negative on that let's just it doesn't matter what the number is right like as long as i've moved three thousand calories in a day if i ate three thousand calories or 2500 is that what i'm trying to do like that deficit number is what i'm trying like how do i know i'm in deficit if i don't have that to sort of tell me is that a fair question totally yeah. I mean, so, um, do you have a wearable? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, what does it tell you? Your, uh, what does your health app tell you that your, your calories are each day? Well, you mean for how many I should have? Um, yeah, I think doesn't Apple tell you like your resting metabolic rate or something like that. God, I don't know. I, I guess I probably don't use it very well. <laughs> I have no idea. I don't know how to use the health app actually. Okay. So um, one, I'll send you a calculator and it, you can just input the numbers that you do have. Um, and it'll, it'll spit out an estimate of your uh, resting metabolic rate and your, your BMR. And you can put the activity in there that you're doing, and then it will increase your, so if you say you work out three times a week or, or whatever, just, you know, uh, it'll give you a nice estimate of what your daily calorie burn is. And there, it is going to be within a hundred or 200, you know, or less than a hundred calories of every other estimator. So it's a good benchmark. So you're, you're against that, right? Mm -hmm. So whatever that number is, your activity plus your uh, resting heart rate or rest, resting metabolic rate, that's the number that you're trying to be at a deficit from. And then I think what's the literature is it 300 calorie deficit a day is a pound a week, 2,500 okay. calories. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. That's the, that's the vision. And then what you do is you just check if that's not what's happening on the scale, you look at your, the, so the, the full correction process is you look at your results on the scale versus what you're inputting every day. And then if you're, if you're feeling good, but you're not seeing in the mirror and on the scale, what you want to see, then you have to make an adjustment and you have to make a call. Do you, have you been feeling tired and hungry or do you feel really energetic and you can, you can cut it a little bit. So that's, that's a, that's a judgment call. Okay, cool. I'm going to go look up how to find my resting metabolic rate. Thank you for that. Term. Yeah, you're welcome. And um, I'll, I'll, I'll send you a, a link to the one I use. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Thanks guys. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Okay. Thanks Bye. so much. Bye.